So the next part of the um, set of exercises, part two, is very similar to part one, but in this case, we add a refractory period to the spike generator. So what this means is that the firing rate, and this is a lot more biologically plausible, is not constant um, all the time, but rather it decreases right after a spike. So um, when you have a neuron firing, you can think of this as um, the, for instance, inactivation of the sodium channels uh, along the axon initial segment where action potentials are normally initiated. And um, this mechanism therefore prevents the neurons from firing uncontrollably um, with no sort of time between the individual spikes. And so that allows them to, um, um, to fire the spikes in a discrete fashion. Um, and this refractory period um, is best modeled to be um, exponential, as in um, the sort of value of the firing rate um, relaxes exponentially back to um, the initial uh, firing rate, which was 100 hertz. So it will go like 100 hertz and then drop down to zero and then it will exponentially relax towards the 100 hertz um, again. It is given by this equation here with this tau, which um, essentially just describes how quickly uh, it will relax towards that steady state value. And um, so this is a dynamic equation. And uh, what we need to do is we need to solve this dynamic equation. Um, it's not the easiest thing in the world to do, admittedly. However, if you peek into the mathematical appendix, um, they actually give you um, uh, a general way to solve these um, differential equations uh, with a substitution with a Z. So um, I, I didn't come up with this solution. I just um, sort of derived it. I figured out what they so what you're supposed to do here um, from the mathematical appendix. So um, in particular, what we want to do is we want to get an exact solution for um, the change in R. So essentially what we need to do is we want to um, integrate from the time t to the time delta t, so delta t plus t, so a very, very short um, interval of time and see how the firing rate changes. And uh, we're going to be using this substitution z. Um, so that's going to look like this, the uh, firing rate at any given time t minus the steady state firing rate, so that would be 100 hertz in our case. Um, and then you can just follow the mathematics. So first I did for the left-hand side um, with a um, few more steps than you actually find in the book itself. So this is a little bit more uh, of a complete solution which uh, really holds your hand um, every step of the way. Um, I personally definitely struggled with this. So uh, I needed to write down all of these steps uh, to arrive at the final solution. And so once you get the left-hand side and the right-hand side, um, you arrive at this equation. And remember, the Z is substituted, so you have to uh, substitute um, the stuff that Z is hiding back into the equation, and you end up with this. Um, but obviously, you want to solve for the R of T plus um, delta T, so you move the R um, steady state onto the right-hand side of the equation, and this is what it looks like. So this is quite a common solution to all of these ordinary uh, differential equations, wherein we have this exponential relaxation terms, um, wherein um, the the firing rate gradually increases from zero to that steady state value. Um, this is just a, a very small side note that um, the delta t is so small that we just assume the firing rate doesn't change in this window, but that's um, that's just a detail. So moving on, we have figured out the mathematics part of the exercise and now we can um, redo 
the spike generator. Uh, however, we need to change the lambda every time there is uh, a spike, which means that we need to set the value to um, we need to set the value to um, whatever this firing rate is meant to be at that point. So right after zero, we set the lambda to be zero as well. And then uh, we use this um, equation that we calculated above and we implement it here. Now the exercise also suggests that we can try using a variety of these tau. So that will just depend how quickly it will uh, change back to um, the steady state, um, wherein um, the lower the tau, the faster we will change back. So the lower this value, so the closer to one millisecond, the steeper the exponential relaxation will be towards the steady state. So once we um, arrive here, I chose a variety of these tau. So one millisecond, five, 10, and 20. And then we also want to calculate the final factors again um, for um, for the spike counts, depending on which sized bin we are using, and also the coefficient of variation. Um, so once we um, run the spike generator for, I believe it is 10 seconds, we can then plot the interspike interval. And I did that here. So the legend top in the top right corner shows you what the tau value is. So as you may understand from the graph just by peeking at it, um, if you compare the long tau, so that is when it takes a long time to relax towards that steady state firing rate of 100 hertz from zero, the interspike intervals are actually much longer, which makes sense because the uh, sort of expected average refractory period is longer as well. So there will be um, a lower probability of a spike following immediately another spike. However, when you have a very low refractory period of one millisecond, that's plotted here in blue, and that is actually very similar to the distribution that we saw above, wherein there was no, um, no refractory period present at all. And actually, I took the liberty of plotting that as well, using this um, kind of purple color, um, so this is actually, um, this histogram is exactly what we obtained above with the same process that has a no refractory period at all. And um, this just shows you what the relationship is between those two. Then the next thing that we do is we are actually interested in finding what the final factor and the coefficient of variation is for the refractory periods here. So um, we have a variety of these um, taus and the final factor is actually approximately one and it gets a little bit better every time that we go um, up. Um, so that's pretty good. That suggests that the spikes definitely came from the Poisson process. The final factor for 100 milliseconds is not actually um, that good, but it's still um, sort of kind of in the neighborhood or what we're hoping it to be. Uh, and the coefficient of variation, again, is the best when the tau is um, very close to zero. So the interesting thing is the relationship between the coefficient of variation and the refractory period. So we can see that the um, coefficient of variation decreases as a function of the um, sort of length of the refractory period. So the longer the refractory period, the lower 
is the coefficient of variation. And that is um, everything from the second chapter.